Hi, Gary Zacharias here. Thank you for joining me with Apologist Bookshelf. I'm taking a second look at Faith is Not Wishing, 13 Essays for Christian Thinkers by Greg Kokel. Um, he's the president of STR, Stand to Reason. If you go to his website, str.org, you can find this. It's a wonderful booklet. Uh, Paul Copan, William Lane Craig, Craig Hazen, and others praise this book. It's small but powerful. It goes through uh, several issues that people have, challenges that they give to Christianity. The, for example, in the chapter that I did previous uh, in an earlier podcast, it was faith is not wishing. Christian faith is actually active trust. It's active trust in what we believe is true because we've put together evidences. Now, I want to do the chapter called, Is God Just a Crutch? And he says that you're going to hear things like, well, you believe in God, you need an emotional crutch. And so he says what happens is the Christians' views are just dismissed. They're not even looked at. They're not even discussed. They're not even thought about or, or actively engaged with because, oh, hey, you have an emotional need. He said, notice what's going on there. <clears throat> it's actually a comment about the believer, not the belief. See, so it's, a, it's an ad, called an ad hominem attack in a sense. You're saying you're a weak person. Well, you know, we might be weak, but let's look at the evidence. So he said, uh, let, let's check that out. So it says, uh, if a challenge focuses on you, like your psychological state or your cultural conditions or your personal biases, and it doesn't look at your beliefs, then it says a red flag should go up. You can't refute a view by attacking something else. Yeah. So he says uh, German philosopher Feuerbach was the first to suggest that God was just a psychological projection. So for him, it was a neurosis that people had. God was a placebo or a crutch or a function of religious wishful thinking. Uh, Freud and Nietzsche and Mark all said the same thing. Mark said religion is the opiate of the people. So... Coco says, well, wait a minute. Does it follow that if I want God to exist, then he doesn't exist? He says, that's definitely crooked logic. And so he says, you know, psychological motivations will give you information about the person who believes, but it tells you nothing about the truth of the person's belief. Psychological motivations don't have anything to do with whether a belief is true or not. So he says, somebody may say, well, Christians just want a father figure. You know, that's that whole idea of... Uh, it's a psychological projection here. We just want a father figure. So Coco says, well, maybe we do, maybe we don't. But what does that have to do with whether God exists or not? I might be wrong to think that God is a protective father, and the critic could be wrong in thinking God is just a psychological projection. So that doesn't get us any closer to the truth at all. And so he quotes from C.S. Lewis. I think it's a terrific quote. Now, I love anything that C.S. Lewis has to say. So Excuse me, put up with me here for a minute, because I do want to quote this. Suppose, this is Lewis talking, now suppose I think, after doing my accounts, that I have a large balance at the bank. And suppose you want to, you want to find out whether this belief of mine is wishful thinking. You can never come to any conclusion by examining my psychological condition. Your only chance of finding out is to sit down and th work through the sum yourself. If you find my arithmetic wrong then it may be relevant to explain psychologically how I came to be so bad at arithmetic. But only after you have yourself done the sum and discovered me to be wrong on purely mathematical grounds. In other words, you must show that a man is wrong before you start explaining why he is wrong. I want to take that last sentence because I think that's so important. So here's what Lewis is saying to the critic or the skeptic out there who says, well, the Christian is uh, psychologically weak and needs a crutch, and that's God. But Lewis says you have to show that a man is wrong. In other words, there really is no God before you start explaining why he is wrong. I thought that was really powerful. So Lewis shows that it's kind of an evasion when people do that sort of a challenge. So he said our question, the big question, of course, does God exist? You've got to answer that with reasons first, not dismiss the question with some kind of misleading talk about motives or desires. Give me convincing arguments, he says, that God doesn't exist before you start asking me why I would believe in such a fantasy. He says, notice instead people find it easier to just ignore the arguments and just fault the feelings, go after the person. 
He says we see that all the time. Okay, let's come toward the end of the chapter here. He says, uh, sadly, Christians uh, are often guilty of the same kind of error. He said, I've frequently heard the content of modern psychology dismissed as bogus because it came from irreligious people who hated God. Well, okay, again, you notice that you're attacking the people rather than the argument itself. So it says, uh, never forget Lewis's rule. First, you must show that a man is wrong before you start explaining why he is wrong. And I wanted to go back to something that he said at the beginning of the chapter that I hadn't mentioned before because I think it's so good. He says, uh, the game could be played the other way around. Maybe the skeptic's atheism is a crutch as well, an invention of his own non-religious wishful thinking. The axe cuts both ways. Isn't that interesting? So in other words, the atheist says to you as a Christian, oh, you and your religious beliefs, that's just a crutch to help you get through life. But it works the other way around too. Maybe that person's atheism is a crutch an invention of that person's non-religious wishful thinking. He or she does not want there to be a God. In fact, Aldous Huxley, this is just me talking, but Aldous Huxley said that. He said that he basically was looking for a free love, free sex kind of life. And uh, so he thought that not being religious would get him that and uh, get him places and politics and things like that. So That's kind of how he came to the idea that there was no God. He didn't start by looking at the evidence. He started with how he felt about things. Okay, so let me come back to what Kokel was talking about toward the end of this uh, chapter. And by the way, the the chapter is brief. They all are in this book, but they give you a lot of good things to think about. So he says, all right, here's a question. So we have invented this idea of a God to make us feel better, right? That's what the atheist thinks. So Kokel says, well, really? If you were to invent a god, what would he be like? Now think about that. What kind of god would you invent? This is, again, just me throwing some things in here. I'd want a forgiving god, a kind god, a god that pats me on the head, a god that gives me everything just for me being who I am. But he, Kokel says, if we fashioned a god of our choosing, would we create a god like the one in the Bible? If you made a god by human hands, he would be like us. He would think like us and act like us. His morality would reflect our desires. If we made terrible mistakes, he'd just cluck his disapproval and dismiss our frailties. Just, oh, you know, kids will be kids. Nobody's perfect. And this is the kind of God many people do believe in, but not Christianity. So the curious thing about the God of the Bible is how unlike us he is. His wisdom is far beyond ours. His purity is scary. He makes moral demands on us that we can't live up to, and then he threatens retributions if we don't obey him. If we call him, if we ring a bell and ask him to come, he defies manipulation. And he has things all backwards. The weak and the humble prevail in his system. So Coco says, is this Christian God the kind of God men would create if we were just left to our own devices? Or have we seen the true God and trembled and closed our eyes and tried to hide our faces and turned our backs and talked about motives and psychological states because we didn't want to deal with that. So Coco says, if somebody insists that Christ is a crutch, he said, I'd agree. I, yeah, I'm, I get it. Christ is a crutch. Crippled people need crutches. Is he just a crutch? No. Thoughtful Christians can give reasons to show that God is real, regardless of the motivations. Thank goodness the truth of Christianity doesn't rest on our feelings. So, I think that's powerful to think about. Can I go back and say that again? So, if somebody insists Christ is a crutch, yes, he is. Crippled people need crutches. And guess what? Who's crippled? We all are. Kokel says, I'd like to know about the skeptic's crutch, because we are all crippled. We're all leaning on something to hold us up. What's the atheist? What's the challenger putting his ultimate trust in? And more to the point, can his crust crutch hold him? So I would think about things like, what, what do people that don't have God, what do they put their trust in? Politics? Well, how has that worked out? We elect a president every four years, and uh, they come in with all these wonderful goals and these great slogans, and within six months, their approval rating is down. They haven't been able to produce everything that they said they would like to. Okay, so there's a crutch that's failed. 
Um, how about money? For a lot of people, their, their crutch, what they're leaning on, counting on, is money. Now, how has that worked out? Well, we hear all the time of people that have gone bankrupt and uh, savings and loans have failed, uh, businesses have failed, people have lost everything. So how about that? Does that hold up? Well, no. What about our, our uh, job status? Well, we know that people lose jobs. So is that a crutch that we can always depend on? How about health? Is our health something we can always depend on? No, absolutely not. I mean, I'm getting older and I'm starting to see things uh, <laughs> appearing in my life that I didn't have to deal with before. So uh, I'm not depending on that. I know I, I shouldn't depend on that because that's going away. Uh, what else? Relationships. That's a crutch for a lot of people. Getting a good person in their life to be married to or going out with. And that doesn't always work out. Something like half of all marriages fail. So the question is, what's our crutch? Everybody needs a crutch. Right? We're all crippled in some way. And what are we putting our trust in? What's, what's our crutch going to do? He says, focusing on feelings is never going to answer it. So I think this is a really powerful chapter. And again, let me just remind you of some of the things that he talks about in this book. So I covered the first chapter, Faith is Not Wishing. I just covered now, Is God Just a Crutch? Here's a third one. Was Jesus a fraud? So we're starting to hear now that, that he was just a copycat from earlier religions. All right, So Egyptian deities and things like that. How about this? The heathen and the unknown God. What do we do with a person that hasn't heard about Jesus? How about where was God? That's a chapter title. He's dealing with uh, evil and pain and suffering. He has a chapter called Christianity's Real Record. In other words, has Christianity done bad things in the history of the world or good things? Now, what about science? He has a chapter called Science Held Hostage. Is Christianity an enemy of science? Is there a constant clash? He has a chapter called Why Hate Shouldn't Be a Crime. That's interesting because people do want to have that as a uh, hate crime. And then the last chapter is called The Intolerance of Tolerance. Don't we hear a lot about tolerance these days? Oh, yeah. We need to be a tolerant people. And so he talks about those that spend the most time dealing with tolerance and pushing it on others are not necessarily the most tolerant people themselves. So that's it. He's got a total of, uh, well, I skipped a few, but probably about 11 or 12 chapters here. And each one's about, I don't know, eight pages, six pages. Uh, so they're pretty short, easy to get through. And uh, as his point is, Christianity is not wishful thinking. It's a sure conviction grounded in evidence. So anything by Kokel, I highly recommend. And this is an excellent place to start. Nice, uh, short book with good, thoughtful chapters in it. Well, thanks for joining me today. And uh, we'll do another podcast soon.